without further ado, I would like to get us started and welcome Zach, the CEO of Plaid, up here. First of all, thank you so much for having everyone here, and this is a beautiful new new space that you've got. So. Of course, yeah. This is uh, we opened this space like this part of the space like a week ago, so uh, still working on. There's like a little bit of echo, and uh, you know there'll be some more paint on the walls at some point soon. But it, it looks really good. Um, we're happy to have everyone. Absolutely. So I'm sure there are a lot of people here who want to hear things about like you know what's going forward and what's happening with Visa, but that's not actually what I want to talk about. I'm much more excited to talk about the story of Plaid and where you guys have been because you've done a lot of exciting things over the time. So let's start off way back. Tell me like what's the story about how Plaid began? Sure. So um, we, we can talk about the Visa thing because it's uh, obviously news, but um, uh, I agree. Uh, let's let's talk more about. Uh, kind of history of Plaid and, and, and where we're going. Um, so the the genesis story of Plaid was uh, a, a bunch of accidents that led to uh, something that, that eventually kind of worked. Um, in the earliest days, uh, William, my co-founder and I, who's still up there in the slide, um, <laughs> we had uh, we had both worked in uh, kind of consulting briefly, but both had kind of engineering and, and software development backgrounds before. Um, and in consulting, we'd both had some experience working with financial institutions. Um, and around the time that we left, we had this idea that we could help consumers better understand their financial lives. Um, basically, we wanted to build a better version of Mint that was a little bit more active. Um, and that's not a new idea, nor is it a particularly good idea. Uh, like that's a lot of people's first yeah. idea. It's of not a good idea. Like a better Mint. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, both of us kind of left our jobs, started to go work on this. Uh, we worked on building, you know, this 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 better mint or or uh, you know a better version of of uh, spend tracking, uh, and we worked on this amongst other things uh, for a little while and realized it was kind of a complete failure for for, for two big reasons. Um, first and foremost, getting data from banks is incredibly difficult. Um, this is the problem that Plaid ended up going on to solve. Uh, so we had to build both kind of the back end and the consumer app at the same time. Um, second is that uh, if you build an app that tells people to do something they don't want to do, they immediately delete your app. Um, and so despite the fact we got like... Like save more money, don't buy yeah, this. No, it's yeah. like, no, actually, we would tell people, please spend less money. Uh, or you can't spend any more money. And then they would delete our app, um, which <laughs> kind of makes sense. Um, so I uh, found out simultaneously we were bad at building consumer apps and good at building infrastructure, so ended up going down the infrastructure path. Um, but the, the uniting thesis for everything that we've done ha has always been uh, make money easier for everyone, make money easier for people. So try to make, make a financial ecosystem in which people have more control, more understanding, more knowledge, so on and so forth. It turns out we've had the same mission the entire time. Uh, we were trying to build consumer applications. We actually, we didn't just build one, we built like six of them all equally created consumer uh, desire to delete them. Um, uh, but we built six, six different consumer apps, all focused on how do we give people more power, more understanding of their financial life. And then uh, over time realized that the infrastructure was much more powerful uh, because we could serve thousands of different applications, building all sorts of different tools with people that understood consumers better Plus, than Plus, if you built six apps, you, you start to like, you're like, man, it'd be nice if our infrastructure worked a little better to support them. That, and also we quickly realized that we were bad at <laughs> the consumer part. Um, so uh, ended, up, uh, ended up creating this infrastructure layer, and we're fortunate to have a couple amazing early customers who gave us tons of feedback. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, after we landed on the right product, it was just an exercise in uh, kind of scaling efficiently, hiring great people, and um, uh, well, lots and lots of work over the ensuing years. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd love to hear some of the stories about what it took to get the initial versions of the product off the ground and some of those initial customer stories and journeys. Yeah, so when we finally landed on uh, the infrastructure product, um, it's not as if there was a fintech ecosystem. Uh, so this was in the end of 2012, early 2013. And when you think of fintech products, uh, there was PayPal, uh, there was Mint, uh, which had been acquired a little bit before that. Yep. Um, uh, and then there wasn't much Lending else. Lending Club was around, but yeah, there wasn't a whole yeah, lot there, of there was Lending Club was yeah, around. Uh, Venmo existed. Uh, and that, like, th there just weren't all that many products that you think of in, in digital finance. Um, Yet there were also all these uh, kind of budgeting apps that were built on kind of manual uploads. And so uh, in the earliest days, uh, we had a handful of companies that we knew that were giving us good product feedback. Um, uh, one of them being actually the early Venmo team. This was when Venmo was about 20 people. And they would tell us, hey, this permutation of your product doesn't work for us, but that permutation that you haven't built yet does. Please build it. 
we didn't build it for a little while. Um, uh, but also, uh, given that we are effectively a flywheel business, meaning uh, when we get customers to build on Plaid, then we grow, uh, we had to kind of start the flywheel spinning. So we actually did a lot of outreach to these budgeting applications. Um, it's funny, you need a budget at YNAB, if some of you know that. Uh, they finally became a Plaid customer like last year, and I started emailing them in 2012, saying, hey, you should, you should, you should use this infrastructure. Um, but along the way, we were able to find a few good customers that gave us a lot of good feedback, helped, start, helped kind of us understand what we should build and started to grow. And then uh, Venmo was about our fifth or sixth customer. Yeah. Um, and they were the first one to hit a lot of scale. And they helped us figure out how to kind of make a couple tweaks to our product set such that it worked better for them. Yeah, building infrastructure is definitely like a chicken and the egg thing. It's like hard to build great infrastructure until you have like a lot of demand on it and it's super helpful to have customers. I think you guys are also in just a super interesting position having seen the customers of Plaid evolve over time. So I'd love to hear kind of looking back over the FinTech ecosystem about some of the different stages and the kinds of use cases of Plaid and how that has evolved and how that's reflected the evolution in the FinTech market yeah. generally. So the, the early, early FinTech was two things. It was either personal financial management, so the Mint clones that we tried to build, um, or it was uh, paying someone for something. Um, so Venmo, PayPal, so on and so forth in, in, in that stance. Um, over time, we started to see a bunch of other waves pop up. Uh, so we had the robo-advising and investing wave, uh, direct investing, um, uh, crypto was one. And, and these are obviously out of order, but um, there, there were a bunch of these different waves. Um, what we actually found to be the most telling about fintech companies is if they solve the customer acquisition problem uh, at like their nascent, so if they find a way to acquire customers quite easily, um, then they end up growing rapidly on the other side. So that could be a variety of different things. Um, we've all seen the Robinhood wait lists. So they generated a ton of buzz. They had a bunch of like organic acquisition because people were talking about it, and then they were able to solve customer acquisition. Uh, Venmo has and Square Cash have obvious network effects where you can send money from one one person to another, and then you know they will invite their friends to, to use the product. Um, there are certain things, be that organic channels, uh, things that just stand out. But what we found is a lot of the companies that solve customer acquisition first end up becoming the most successful. Um, and those that don't, honestly, end up struggling because it's very expensive to acquire customers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, so we've talked a little bit about where FinTech ecosystem has been. And I know that you posted your, your predictions for 2020 about where things are going a little bit. I'd love to hear a little bit about some of those. You had some things like you know, demographics, not geography, and some other things. So maybe, maybe talk about things that you're seeing now. From yeah, future. I wrote some predictions for FinTech last year, what would happen this year. And they were mostly wrong. So I don't quite know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, they're all just guesses. Um, so one of the ones that we talked a little bit about was this concept of demographics, not geographics. Um, and if you work at Plaid, you've heard me talk about this, so it's going to be boring. Um, but basically, 10 years ago, the way that we interacted with our bank was based on geography. Um, where was the closest bank? Because we had to walk into a branch to talk to a banker to do almost everything in our financial lives. And oftentimes, when we moved, we would switch banks. Um, uh, we would go to the bank that had the closest ATM. Um, today, when we make a financial decision, uh, it's based on uh, kind of the product that we need at the time. Uh, so we're making a decision to sign up for a bank account on the internet. If we're applying for a loan, we oftentimes will Google uh, before we decide what loan to apply for, um, so on and so forth. And so what we've seen is that the concept of a physical branch is no longer as necessary, um, but the concept of a digital relationship is really important. And further, what we've seen is that the companies that have these digital relationships try to bundle products that appeal to us. So it's hard to acquire a customer the first time. It's hard to get someone to open a checking account or to, to make a first investment or to take out a loan. It's easy to sell them the second product because they're already there. They're captive in your platform. And so we see a lot of products, uh, a lot of our customers and a lot of FinTech now starting to bundle products around uh, the needs of a specific user that they're able to acquire. And then especially when they grow due to network effects, they're bundling based on uh, the specific demographics of that network and where it lives. And so what we're seeing is instead of a bank having to be everything to everyone because anyone can walk in off the street uh, to go talk to a branch or to talk to a banker in a branch, um, now the, 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 the clustering of, of FinTech applications or, or FinTech products is really, really tight. Um, and it's around a, the specific needs of a certain uh, demographic. Uh, certainly the customers that they acquire would want to use more and more products there. So that's one. Yeah. No, I think I totally agree. Like the idea of rebundling is a very 
kind of apt a thing to be thinking about as all these new banks have scaled and are starting to think about next products. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit too about how you're thinking uh, Plaid's continued role in the ecosystem as an infrastructure provider. Obviously, if you're bundling in more products to thing, maybe there are, there are new things that you need from an infrastructure perspective to, to allow that. So it'd be great to hear a little bit on, on how Plaid's thinking about infrastructure going forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this is where kind of the, the visa bit also comes into play. But um, as we think about uh, what's holding FinTech back, um, uh, a lot of it, a lot of that insight just comes from talking to customers, and understanding the things that customers are asking for, saying that they need. Um, one of the there's kind of two areas that we've been thinking about um, uh, broadly, and, and Bitcoin can talk about this in, in more specifics as well. Um, but first is around just reliability of data connectivity to the banks. Um, this is an incredibly hard problem to solve. Um, banks predominantly don't have APIs, or they certainly didn't when we started. Uh, we have to work with the banks to figure out a way to create a structured and secure data transfer. And a lot of the banks go down, and a lot of the banks change their minds on certain things, so they change the ways that we have to integrate. Um, and that's kind of frustrating. Uh, and so one of the advantages of us working with Visa is actually that they have a gigantic like, team of people that are out talking to the banks all the time, so that actually helps us a lot. Um, but um, as we think about kind of going forward, uh, kind of one, one big push is on consistency, reliability around the financial institutions. Second is thinking about international and inter internationalization. So we have a lot of companies from the US going international. And a lot of the international companies coming to the US, we actually see probably more net, net uh, uh, kind of incoming companies than, than companies exporting products, um, which has been exciting and interesting to see. I think it's gonna, the, the neobanks are going to set off a new wave of, of competition uh, uh, with the big banks, which will be really fascinating to watch over the few years coming. Yeah the, yeah, the demographics and our geographies is interesting if you see banks, exp neobanks expanding internationally, like, well, is there still enough of the product suite that's tightly coupled together to, to make, have that make sense, or do they, they build themselves in kind of um, completely new and different ways? Yeah. Uh, so cool. I, I do want to talk about, uh, change the subject a little bit, because one of my favorite things about Plaid is when I walk into the Plaid offices, I'm just a happier person. I think that's because there are so many great people who work at this company. So I also want to talk a little bit about, tell me how you've thought about building the Plaid culture over time and how you've attracted so many wonderful in individuals to come, come and work here. Uh, well, I think... That, some exceptions we might hear from one later tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, Baker aside. Um, I'm not sure there's quite an answer to building culture. Um, people always ask me what the culture's like, and I say, go, go talk to the people, because the culture's not me, it's everybody else that you meet, it's everybody else that you spend time with. Um, we tend to have a, a set of uh, pretty focused hiring processes, processes um, and we spend a huge amount of time recruiting. So I'm a big believer that uh, I can't quite describe the culture, because every time we hire a new person, every time they start, they forever change the culture. And in my first conversation uh, with everybody uh, in the onboarding process, I say, hi, welcome to Plaid. You now own the company and you own the culture, and, and it's your responsibility to make the culture what you want it to be. Um, and you have forever changed it already just by being here. Um, you guys are changing it right now. Yeah, there we go. Now, all of you. Keep that uh, in from, mind. From being here and interacting with Plaid <laughs> people. Um, we have a handful of, of uh, principles, uh, which are like values. Um, and a lot of them we hold as really important parts of the hiring process. Uh, so one of them uh, that I particularly like is embrace openness and positivity. Um, so uh, this concept of embracing openness, uh, we want to be really open about everything that happens. We want to be open with each other. We want to be giving a lot of feedback uh, and willing to receive it. And then the concept of positivity is something that I'd long realized was a part of Plaid, but I hadn't been able to put my finger on exactly what. Um, it was about two years ago, I did this big, big uh, kind of set of visits to a bunch of the banks and a bunch of our customers. Um, and in, in a lot of the banks, you would walk around and you'd look and you'd see people that were just unhappy. Uh, they were like there to get a paycheck. They were there to do the thing they had to do. Um, and I, I don't mean to call out banks when I say this, I just happened to be in a bank office. Uh, and they came back into the Plaid office and people were smiling. They were like talking to each other. It was, it was friendly and fun. And so uh, positivity, we realized, was kind of a, a core part of our culture, something that's worth calling out and, and, and being precise about. Um, and uh, th it is one of my favorite things when, when walking around the office is that uh, people are focused. There's a huge amount of work to do, uh, but we come, up, come at it with a positive attitude. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's definitely that vibe going on around positivity. Well, cool. Those are the questions I wanted to cover here tonight. I'm sure that the uh, audience has a few questions, too, so maybe we'll do a couple of those, and then we'll turn on over to Baker. So 
I, who has questions? I know someone here has a question. Uh, let's, let's start out there in the back with the first one. And actually, uh, if you shout it out, I can maybe repeat it. Or, or we can run a mic to you. All right, so question one was, what was our relationship like with the banks pre-Visa? So uh, the Visa transaction has not closed, so I would just say, what, is, what are our bank relationships like? Uh, question number two is, what do I think about API standardization? Yeah, sorry, there's a little bit of echo, so if, if that's an issue, just yell. Um, so the, the first one, uh, our relationships with the banks, I would characterize it as good but complex. Uh, we started Plaid, we started building the actual product of Plaid about seven and a half years ago. And uh, when going to the banks, uh, a lot of our conversation is, hi, we're here to help enable FinTech because your customers love FinTech. Um, and that's true and important. Um, uh, but a lot of the banks heard us say, hi, we're here to enable your competitors because your customers want to use your competitors. Um, and that's a really hard pitch to make. Um, and so ultimately, we, we kept on focusing and, and repeating and, and, and talking about this concept of consumer control, allowing a consumer to do the things in their financial life that they want to, lives that they want to do. Um, and ultimately, that's a very positive, positive message. Um, we had a lot of people in our corner. Uh, so many of the regulators were actually very pro-consumer, ensuring that consumers have access to data and can use the products and tools and services that they want. And that was really great. But what really tipped the scale for us was when we got enough consumers to say, hey, this is a big deal. I need this. Um, I remember we had one instance where uh, a certain bank, um, uh, who shall not be named, um, shows that they did not want their customers to work very well with a certain peer-to-peer -peer payments application, uh, who shall also not be named. <laughs> and what we actually saw was a lot of consumers voting with their feet and switching banks, and that actually sent a pretty big message to, 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 to the bank that, you know, this, this fintech thing actually matters. And that, that was relatively early on in, in the life lifecycle. So um, I would say uh, they're, they're complex, they're tenuous, but ultimately what I hear the bankers say over and over again is that they want their consumers to have access to the things that they want. And so we're very aligned in that standpoint. Um, there's just, there, there's tension because uh, we do, we enable other banks to build great fintech products. Um, so it's, 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 a, um, it's a set of problems that we've focused a lot on and I think we're in a very good place, but there's always back and forth. Second question is, what do I think of API standardization? It's a nice idea in concept. I don't know if any of you read XKCD, but there's a really wonderful XKCD on standardization, which is uh, someone goes and reads a bunch of standards, and they say, oh, all these standards are terrible. We can do it way better. And then they end up writing another standard. Um, and uh, that is my fear sometimes with API standardization. Um, but ultimately, I think when we think about the way that we integrate with the banks and the way that we get data, um, there's a pragmatic approach, which is to say, we'd like to have a standard, we'd like to have a goal, we'd like to have a set of principles that we operate on, but we're willing to work with the bank in whatever way they need to. Right. And then maybe one more. Sorry, that's Short a really one. long answer. <laughs> Tony. What would I tell someone this building? If Tony is out? starting his own, or has started his is own it, Is it a personal financial years. management app? <laughs> um, it's right, it's so much more than that. I, I, I actually do think, so personal financial management is a very important space, um, but, but I, I think without knowing at all what you're working on, um, I, I would recommend finding some way to be differentiated um, and looking for the thing that the customer actually truly deeply loves and is willing to talk about. So um, solving the customer acquisition problem early is crucial. Uh, finding a way to generate referrals, generate something that people are willing to talk about, generate buzz, organic press, whatever it is, um, but not, do, not acquiring customers through paid channels at first um, is, is pretty important. So finding something that customers love enough to go out, go out and, and talk about. Um, and then I actually am a big believer in automation tied to action. Um, so in, in the PFM space, um, I think that if you can identify certain triggers, certain things that might happen in someone's financial accounts, and then tie that to uh, kind of right execution, so if my balance gets low, then transfer money in to stop me from overdrafting. Um, those kinds of things are actually pretty sticky, we've seen. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're working on, but there are definitely interesting models in, in, in personal financial management. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Zach, for spending some time with us this evening, and thanks everyone for coming out.